we're going to be talking about three main um, characteristics. Number of cells, complexity of cells, and um, type of nutrition. So the animal kingdom, first of all, we're all familiar with it, obviously. And the animal kingdom is the largest in terms of number of identified species. Almost three quarters of known species are in the animal kingdom. Now the question is, well, is that because animals are easy to find and identify? They're big. We see them all the time. I don't know. But. So how about um, in terms of number of cells? What word will we use to describe everything in the animal kingdom? Multicellular. Yeah, multicellular. They're all multicellular. All animals are made of more than one cell. What about complexity in terms of what we just talked about? Do animal cells contain the nucleus and other organelles? They do. So what word do we use to describe them, Habib? Eukaryotes. Yeah, they are eukaryotes. And if we think about their nutrition, their method of obtaining energy, what word would we use to describe animals? Peter? Um, right? Heterotrophs. They have to go out and find other organisms to consume in order to get their energy. So there's a wide variety of animals from very simple things like a sponge up to very complex organisms like an elephant and a whole range in between. Okay? Things like worms, um, mussels, clams, um, lobsters, butterflies, ants, spiders, um, frogs, all are animals. They all have these same characteristics that we just listed. A sponge is a living organism, yeah. We'll talk about, we're gonna talk about invertebrates as a section of this unit. We'll talk more about sponges and, and what they actually are. <coughs> so that's the animal kingdom, which we're all familiar with. Plant kingdom, also we're familiar with, I'm sure. Um, in terms of plant kingdom, number of cells, what word will we use to describe them? Multicellular. Multicellular. Complexity of their cells. What term would we use? Also eukaryote. So we sound a lot like animal kingdom. Well, what about nutrition? What do we talk about that? Uh, autotrophic. Yeah, they are autotrophic. They are able to um, create glucose through photosynthesis. So they can make their own food. They are autotrophs. Right? Um, probably somewhat. Yeah. Fish. Yeah, they need to. They need water just like any other living organism. Some they can absorb through their tissue, probably. Some they consume as they eat. So, yeah, they do. Um, so examples of plants: trees, corn, grass. For sharing. <laughs> All right, so let's get to some things that maybe are a little bit more unfamiliar. Now, fungi, you know, people see a, a mushroom growing out of the soil and they lots of times think it's a plant. Okay, it doesn't move, it just sort of grows there. How is it different than a plant though? Huh? It needs a plant. Yeah, it's different in terms of nutrition. <coughs> um, mushrooms are known as a decomposer. Okay? The mushrooms break down organic matter in the soil. For example, in my front yard, we have a, between like the road and our sidewalk, there used to be a tree there, but it died, so we cut it down, ground up the stump. But in that exact area where the tree used to be, each spring, we get a huge patch of mushrooms um, that grow there each spring. So why do they continue to appear there every single spring? What's going on? Juliet? 
Yeah, there's still the remains of roots and stuff that are in the ground that weren't removed, and those mushrooms are decomposing it. They're breaking down. They have these root-like structures that secrete enzymes that break down the wood, the organic material, and they absorb that. That's what they use for energy. They absorb that material. And so um, that's why they're called decomposers. All right, so fungi, um, again, they are multicellular or unicellular. We'll talk about the unicellular examples in a second. But they can, some types of fungi are unicellular, some are multicellular. They are also eukaryotic, so they have a nucleus, in other words. They're also, they have a cell wall. Now, it's a different type of cell wall from the plant. It's not made of cellulose, but they also have a cell wall. And they don't have chlorophyll, so they're not autotrophic. They're heterotrophic. Sure, probably a lot of you have seen puffballs before. Yeah. Little mushrooms, they might grow in your backyard. They actually get pretty big. They can be you know, this big. You ever squeeze one of them? Yes. Stuff comes out. What's coming out? Uh, seeds. Close to <laughs> seeds. And fungi, we call them something else, spores, reproductive cells. So those are going to float through the air. Eventually, they land somewhere and start to grow into new mushrooms. So actually, puffballs are edible if you get them young before they sort of dry out. The flesh is like a regular kind of mushroom if you get, if you get them early. No. Dandelion's a plant. But they reproduce in a similar way, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes, because in dandelion, each of those little fuzzy things is attached to a tiny little seed which floats away. Yeah, so they disperse spores like plants disperse seeds. I have a story about a, uh, what, what was it called? The puffball? Yeah. In my uh, grandma's old apartment, there was this huge puffball on, on the side of her driveway. Mm -hmm. And she rents an apartment from somebody else. That um, and one day when we went to pick her up, uh, my dad uh, tried taking the puffball, thinking, and then the other people came out and yelled at him because they've been watching it grow. Oh really? Yeah. How big was it? Was it really big? Yeah, oh yeah. Huge. Yeah, they get really big sometimes. Like my friend and I, we were like at somewhere, and my friend only like, picked up like. A mushroom and he like threw it at my back and like green like he stepped on it and green like sprouted and where is that the spores? Yeah, those are the spores. Yeah, because he like threw it at my back. Yeah, one way to identify a mushroom, like, you know, people sometimes gather mushrooms to eat, but you have to be very careful because some mushrooms are poisonous. But one um, characteristic you use to identify mushrooms is a score print, where you take like a piece of white paper and put the cap of the mushroom on the white paper and let it sit for um, several hours or overnight. And the spores in the gills that mushroom fall out, and by looking at the color, um, you can. that's one way you can help to Which identify mushrooms. Which color is mushroom. bad? There's no necessarily bad color, but the color is different depending on the species, so it can help you identify. Um, and so they broke, break down organic material. That's <coughs> their means of nutrition. So examples, um, oh, they also are, don't move. They're stationary, they're sessile. Now, another example of a unicellular fungus is yeast. Can you tell me about yeast? Brandon? It's like um, when you put it in the stuff that like, makes the stuff like crumble. Okay. Yeah, yeast is a living organism, single cell fungus. So if you take some yeast and ever make homemade bread at home with yeast, yeah. So you mix it in, there's usually some warm water to sort of activate it because it's kind of dormant when you buy a little packet. You mix it with the flour. Um, and what happens is those yeasts, those living organisms, start to consume sugars, <coughs> uh, carbohydrates in the dough. And they consume them, they use them for energy and respiration, and produce what as a result? What does respiration produce? Well, it does produce energy for the yeast, 
And what are some byproducts? Um, Water. What's the word? Yes. Gas. Gas. Carbon dioxide. Those carbon dioxide bubbles are what cause the dough to rise. So when you cut into a slice of bread and you see little holes, little air pockets that make the bread like fluffy, each of those was where some carbon dioxide was released by the yeast and formed a little bubble in there. Uh, and that's why the bread, the dough rises after you add the yeast. Now some yeast also go through this process called fermentation, where they can consume uh, carbohydrates, produce carbon dioxide, but one of the byproducts is alcohol. And that's ethanol. That's how yeast are used to make beer and wine. If you mix certain types of yeast with grape juice, they consume the sugars in the grape juice, convert it into alcohol, they use some energy, and they produce carbon dioxide, which can make it carbonate. So alcohol drinks are made using yeast as well. Um, all right, so yeast is a fungus. Mushrooms are a fungus. Mold, you know, that might be on an old slice of bread is a type of fungus or that grows in a wet, damp area. You know, if you have like a damp basement and they have mold growing somewhere, um, that's another type of fungus. All right, let's move on to protus. We're, our next section after we're done with this taxonomy section is going to be all about protus. And um, the protus kingdom is actually kind of just a catch-all where scientists ended up putting lots of different species that didn't quite fit anywhere else. Um, and so there's lots of different characteristics to protists. But they are unicellular, single cell organisms. Some can be um, autotrophs, some are heterotrophs, and some actually are both. Same species can be either autotroph or heterotroph. They're eukaryotes, so they do have organelles and nucleus and so forth. So we won't get into too much detail here, but we're going to be looking um, next week, most likely, at three different types of protists. We're going to look at paramecia, euglena, and the amoeba. Those are three groups of protists. You know, if you go to a pond and you take a sample of the water out of the pond and go look at it under a light microscope, you'll see lots of different organisms swimming around there, microscopic single-cell organisms. They are protists, most of them. All right, and that leads us to our last two pieces. Um, bacteria and archaea. Now, so far, we haven't talked about any kingdoms with what characteristic? Prokaryotic. Yeah, we haven't mentioned any prokaryotic organisms yet. Everything previous to this has been eukaryotic. But bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotes. So simple cells, they're generally very small. Uh, and bacteria are unicellular, single celled organisms. They are prokaryotes. They have no nucleus. They have no mitochondria or chloroplasts and so on. Very, very small. Some are heterotrophs, some are autotrophs. And so you're probably familiar with bacteria because of what? Yes, yeah, some can make you sick. Not all bacteria make you sick. Some are actually beneficial. In our digestive system, we have um, many, many bacteria living in our digestive system that help us break down certain parts of foods that we eat, but to release certain vitamins for us. And in fact, if you damn it, if you destroy all those bacteria, you can get some digestive problems. You can get a stomach ache and cramping. If you ever had to take a strong antibiotic to clear up like an ear infection or something, towards the end, you may start to get like stomach pain and cramping, other conditions. That's often because the antibiotic maybe killed the bacteria that are giving you a urate. Well, what else does it does it kill? All those beneficial bacteria that are in your digestive tract, making it more difficult to digest certain types of food um, and, and causing some some uh, digestive issues. Okay. Um, you know what? Sometimes people say you should do if you're have been taking an antibiotic. What should you eat? Uh, bread. Mm, not bread. Certain types of yogurt, because what's in yogurt? Milk. Some of these bacteria, some of these bacteria that produce yogurt, okay, um, can be helpful to your digestive system as well. Is that why you eat some yogurt? 
I just like doing that. Um, so examples, you know, it just has bacteria up here, but does anyone, can anyone name a certain type of bacteria, a specific? Tom? Bacteria. What? Eubacteria. Eubacteria is a big group of bacteria. Do anyone know what bacteria can make you sick? HIV or That's a virus. Um, e. coli. You ever heard of E. coli? What certain types of E. coli can cause food poisoning if there's E. coli in the meat that you eat and it's not cooked properly can make you sick? Salmonella? Probably have heard of. Yeah. Um, strep bacteria. Streptococcus causes your uh, strep throat. That's where the word comes from. Um, there's all sorts of different. Um, bacteria that can um, are pathogens that can cause diseases. Uh, okay, yep, that causes what? Uh, yes, yeah, is that what's called beaver fever? Yeah. If you go out and you're hiking or whatever, you're camping, and you sometimes drink some water from a stream, it may be um, contaminated with certain types of bacteria um, that cause digestive issues, we shall say. All right, and the last group, Archaea. Um, Archaea is a kingdom that was created more recently when scientists began discovering, you know, these, these organisms used to be sort of lumped in with bacteria because they have lots of the same characteristics. They are also unicellular. They're also prokaryote. They also can be heterotroph or autotroph. So it sounds very similar. But once scientists started to explore them in a little more detail, look at um, the structure of them, look at the molecules that compose them, look at their metabolism, they found, well, they're not really that closely related to bacteria. And so they split them off into their own group. These archaea, um, some of them are very interesting. They are often called extremophiles, which means they are organisms which can live in quite extreme conditions. Some types of archaea can survive temperatures above boiling up to like 110 or 115 degrees Celsius. Now usually you think that boiling kills all bacteria and all organisms, but some can survive conditions that are up to past boiling. Some can live in extreme salt conditions, in Great Salt Lake or the Dead Sea where scientists thought organisms couldn't survive under those conditions, but when they look closely they find certain types of archaea that can live in those conditions in very acidic conditions. So these are found in deep sea vents, under the sea where you have um, very hot, uh, very um, inhospitable conditions to most life. There are types of archaea that can live and thrive in those environments. And so that's why they're called sometimes extremophiles. I was reading the book and it said that some scientists found a rock in the deep sea and they observed it and they saw the Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's very, very dense because of the amount of dissolved salt. It's very dense, and as we know from density, less dense objects float in more dense objects, and so yeah, you can float much more easily. Yeah. Really? <coughs> Did you go in the Dead Sea? So how how much easier is it to float in the Dead Sea versus in a pool? Like just like you just you're like. What if it gets in your mouth? This is how salty does it taste. Super salty. Interesting. Cool. All right. So those are our kingdoms. If we look at sort of the distribution of species that have been identified, most are animals. Almost three quarters are animals. In fact, more than half are just insects alone. Here are the other animals. Plants are the next big group. Uh, and then the smaller groups, fungi, um, bacteria, protists, are, are much smaller in comparison. All right, let's start to do this fairly quickly. It's just sort of putting it all together. So for each of these, let's, what words am I looking for you to use here in this row? How does it obtain food? Um, yeah. Heterotroph or autotroph. So, Linda, animals, what word should I use? Heterotroph or autotroph. Heterotroph. 
Tom, how about plants? How about plants? Autotroph. Autotroph. Okay, how about fungi? Autotroph. What's that? Um, heterotroph, actually. Remember, they don't make their own food, they don't have chlorophyll, they have to decompose other things. Dan, how about protists? Both. Some are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs. Jimmy, how about bacteria? Uh, both. Yeah, they also can be both. And archaea, Peter? Um, both. Yeah, they can be both as well. <coughs> now, I don't love this next row because it technically has some errors that you don't <coughs> see. But let's go, let's, let's fill it in. Do the cells contain chloroplasts, Chloe? How about animals? No. no. Matt, how about plants? Yes. Yes. Sarah, fungi? No. no. Protus? No. Sophie, no. Some do, some don't. It depends on the protus. How about bacteria, Kimberly? Technically, Kimberly's right. Even though up here it says some and some, that's really not accurate. Does anyone know why? Why is that technically not accurate? They, prokaryotes. They're prokaryotes. They technically don't have chloroplasts. A chloroplast is a membrane-bound organelle with chlorophyll inside that's used for photosynthesis. Um, these bacteria and archaea, they do have molecules that allow them to absorb sunlight and produce energy, but it's technically not really chloroplasts, but, uh, you know, it acts in a similar way, so that's why it says something. We, we could put down some. We could put down some, that's fine. I just wanted to, I don't want to give you the correct information. It's not technically true, but. Tom? What's that? Mr. Curie made that role. Uh, How about number and number of cells? Uh, where are we here, Brandon? Uh, animals, Brandon. Uh, okay. <laughs> what is the technical word we're going to use for a lot? <laughs> yes, they are multicellular. How about plants, Matt? Multicellular. Also multicellular. Fungi, Nick? Nicholas? Um, multicellular. But some are unicellular, like yeast, for example. Both. Both, both multi-annually, either one. How about protus, Nate? Uh, Which? No. <laughs> You're right, it is either both or no. Uh, it's actually no. You decide. Right? How about bacteria, Caitlin? No? Unicellular? Maddie? Archaea unicide. Okay, eukaryote and prokaryote, Ryan. Animals. Uh, eukaryote. Eukaryote. Rosemary, plants. Eukaryote. Fungi. Sophia? Eukaryote. Protus. Julia? What's that? Eukaryote. Bacteria. CC? No, they're prokaryote. And archaea, maybe? Prokaryote. Pro so just a summary of the characteristics of each of these. Now, domain, so these are the kingdoms, but domain is a group even larger than kingdom. This, all of these organisms, all of these kingdoms are in one domain. Domain is called eukaryote. All these ones in the group. Why do you think that's the name of the domain? Right? Because they're all eukaryotes. Yeah, all the organisms in the eukaryote domain are eukaryotes. And then we have the bacteria in its own domain and archaea in its domain.
Um, you carry out. Yes. All right. Um, we're going to skip this next slide for now. Don't worry about writing anything down. We'll, uh, maybe we'll come back to it sometime. But. All right. Our last topic in this, this section of the unit is something called dichotomous keys. A dichotomous key is a tool you can use to identify an unknown organism. I have up here some examples. These are some dichotomous keys I had to use when I was in college. This one is a key to fruit and twigs of trees. So if I have some random twig that somebody brought in, I can use this key to figure out what that twig came from. And it is a dichotomous key is a series of statements that you read as you're looking at your unknown object. You decide which of the two statements applies, and then you follow the instructions. For example, this key starts off saying, are leaf scars opposite, sub-opposite, or world? And if they are, I'm going to go to two. Or are the leaf scars or buds alternate? So then I go to 45. And I would go to the next statement, I'd read, and eventually it would tell me, what species that twig came from. This one is a key that helps identify fish, inland fish in New York State. All this whole book is about just fish of New York State. This one is a key and in information about vascular <coughs> plants in the Northeast United States. So you go grab a plant out there, flower that you like, bring it in, turn to the key in this book, it's in super small print, hundreds of statements, but as you follow through these statements, you eventually can identify what plant that is. So these are dichotomous keys. We will not be using any as complex as these. You can look at them later. We will use sort of simpler ones, but the process of using it is exactly the same. Let's say I have these finches, and I want to know which finch is which. Basically, I look at the bird, and I read through the statement. So let's, let's do an example. So if I look at this finch, is the beak very thin and the upper beak is much larger than the bottom? No. Or is the beak relatively heavy and top and bottom nearly equal in size? Which yeah. one applies to this? B. 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 So I go, for, okay, telling me go to set two. Is the lower beak smaller than the top or is it as large or larger? As large or larger. Yeah, I'd say as large or larger. Let's go to set three. Is the lower edge of the upper beak have a distinct bend, or is it mostly flat? Lower edge. Distinct. Yeah, look at the end. It's a distinct bend. So, this is a Camarinkus finch. Identified it using this dichotomous key. Let's look at this finch. Beak thin, very thin, upper beak much larger than the bottom, or relatively heavy top and bottom about equal size? Okay. I'd say about, the same, about the same size. Not very thin. Uh, so yeah, let's go to step two. Is the lower beak smaller than the top? Yes. Okay, this is a geospiza finch. Got this one. Is it very thin beak or relatively heavy? Go to two. Is lower beak is large or larger than the top? Yes. Go to three. Is the lower edge mostly flat or have a distinct bend? Mostly flat. Yeah, mostly flat. That is a platyspiza finch. And then the last one. Beak very thin, upper beak much larger than the bottom, or relatively heavy, top and bottom equal size? A. A. This is sort of the DF. Peter? Um, how is the geospiza mm -hmm. finch, uh, how is its beak um, lower beak low, bigger than the uh, top beak? It's not. The lower beak is smaller than the top. Uh. So that's how we use a key. 
And in your notes, you have lots of examples. Here's another one, pretty simple, but again, if you didn't know what these sea creatures were, you can use this key to figure it out. For example, let's take uh, this one. Let's look at this. All right, does it have tentacles present or absent? Present. Present. I go to two. Does eight tentacles or more than eight? More than eight. I go to three. Do the tentacles hang down or are they upright? Yeah. Upright. Oh. Oh. This is hanging down. Oh. Upright, it's a sea anemone. <laughs> so again, you follow statement by statement until you've identified your unknown species. There's another example. Oh <laughs> Anyone seen a movie with creatures that look like these? Yes. What is it? Oh. Oh. Gremlins. Does anybody know one of the rules if you have a gremlin? No. Don't, don't feed them past midnight. Don't feed them past midnight. What's the other rule? Don't get them wet. Don't Dan? Put them in water don't get them wet. Third rule? Uh, they hate sunlight. Yes, keep them out of the sunlight. If you've never seen the movie, it's a good one. You should watch it. Gremlins. What so happens it's from the 80s, like the movie from Miles again. What? What happens if you see all that? What's you don't have, have to watch the movie and see, Kimberly. I don't want to spoil it for you. Each thing has a different result. I'll say that. Each thing has a different result. It's a follow up in the attic. And then something happens to them and they hatch and then they start like eating. 